Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this sixth Sunday of Easter and on this Graduate Recognition Sunday. Uh, we've just had breakfast. I, I see some of you are already nodding off. Uh, it was the bacon. Andrea Enzer tells me the bacon uh, is bad for you. Uh, but we ate it all, nonetheless. <laughs> well, we'll skip over what you said. <laughs> um, if you look inside your bulletin, you'll see a few announcements. You'll also see an insert. On the insert uh, are the pictures and names of almost all of our graduates. Um, the high school on one side, college on the other. Uh, there is one more graduate to name, uh, and her name is Kenna Vickers. Anybody want to guess whose granddaughter she is? Yeah, well, if you guess Janet Matthews, you have a 50% chance of being right, right out of the gate. <laughs> Kenna Vickers is also a graduate, uh, and I wanted to name that this morning. But inside, you'll see others, and on the back, there is a litany. We will use this litany near the end of the service today, so keep that handy as we go along. A few announcements from the inside of the bulletin. Uh, you'll see um, that today is graduation Sunday. Um, you'll see this next Wednesday night is a pretty regular Wednesday night. It's also the end of, ch of regular children's activities until the fall when they start back up again, children and youth. Next Sunday is Ascension Sunday, and there's more down there at the bottom that you can look through at your own uh, uh, leisure. Um, one more uh, piece that I want to announce that's not printed here. Uh, Bridget Myers has asked me, uh, to say that the, you, the children will be in the foyer, out in the foyer after the service, collecting money for Red Nose Charities, which is about childhood poverty. Uh, so they'll be out in the foyer uh, uh, to collect any money for that, uh, and, and you all will make sure to turn it in, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so on your way out, uh, feel free to make a donation uh, to that as well. All right. Well, uh, we're glad you're here. I guess it's time that you stand up and uh, say hello to the people around you.
Our hymn of praise this morning is an insert in your bulletin. Love divine, all love's excelling. Let's stand as we sing together. Let us pray. All loving, all powerful God, we your people gather in this room this morning and we say thank you. Thank you for the gift of spring, for the gift of a fellowship breakfast with people that we love. Thank you for music and for the children's part in that today. And thank you for the privilege it is to be here for worship today, O oh God. Abide with us in this place. 
Breathe on us your Holy Spirit. Hold us as we try to lean in and hear a word and a song from you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, take your order of worship and join me for the litany of invitation and confession printed in the front part. When we look into the horizon and try to imagine where we want to go, we are not alone. And though it sometimes feels that way, When we have dreams and worries about where we'll end up, may we remember. God is on the path. When we've been given so much advice that we wind up more confused than not. God is on the path. When we want the right school and the right job and the right possessions. God is beside us on the path, even when we stumble. We confess that too often we try to take control, or try to take shortcuts in order to have an easier journey. We confess that we forget to acknowledge those who walk or even limp alongside us. Sisters and brothers, even in the midst of our pride, our stubbornness, our weakness, and our wrong turns, God is beside us on the path, offering grace and support. We are forgiven. Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. Paul preaches to the diverse intellectual crowd in Athens, a reading from the book of Acts. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. God doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since God is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God, we live move and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are God's offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone everywhere 
to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Here ends the first lesson. And now let us pause and take a deep breath and ready our hearts to say our prayers. God, this morning we gather and are thankful for new beginnings and new chapters on this journey. We come here knowing that you are the author of a story that is so much bigger than our own, and that you have woven us together and into your larger story. And God, as is true of all stories, we know that there are different parts to this journey of life. And Lord, some of us this morning are excited about what is on the horizon and full of energy. Others of us, Lord, struggle to look forward and instead find our glance drawn to the past. We remember people we have loved and lost, situations that deteriorate, and for some of us, sadness claims our hearts this morning. But Lord, whether we are in a waiting place or a joyful place or a sad or uncertain place in our journey, this morning we gather together to draw comfort that reminds us that we never walk alone. You are with us even in the tough times. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for opportunities to practice reminding our souls that you will never abandon us. And Lord, as part of that practice, we pray now the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray so long ago. And we join our voices with Christians over generations and around the world and boldly say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power
Okay, if any other, all right, boys, come on down. And Becca and Destiny, will you join us down here too? I know you're not kids, but you've only got like today and that's it. <laughs> you can see right there, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so today's a special Sunday, it's graduation Sunday. Typically, with any special Sunday, we kind of have a theme, right? So let's see. I'm going to look at my choir folder, my bulletin here. We did the litany of invitation and confession. God is beside us on the path. We said that one, two, three, four, five, like six times. God is beside us on the path. And then Christy read the first lesson. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God, we live, move, and exist. Here in just a second, we're going to get the second lesson, no, the gospel lesson. And it says, you know him because he lives with you and will be with you. Anybody got the theme yet? No? Okay, well, let's see. This is probably one of my most favorite books ever. I love Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss was a very smart man. He wrote books about not giving into prejudice. He wrote books about taking care of our earth and our environment. He wrote books about not judging one another. And he wrote them all as children's books. And he put, he had beautiful illustrations. And he, the best part about it is that he made up his own words. And some of them are really nonsensical words, and yet we think they're awesome. And every time I read a Dr. Seuss book, I get a little tongue-tied because his words are sometimes kind of strange and funny. But they also kind of make me giggle, and they make me smile, and they make me feel good. I start every year of class with this book with my kids. And I wanna, I'm not going to read the whole book because it's kind of long. But it starts with, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. This is the part that I focus on with my kids. It says, you have brains in your head and feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. Everybody got a brain? Check, check. Feet? Check. Okay, that means that you get to make your own choices. And it talks about the first several pages are about all the wonderful things that will happen and you're going to be so successful and it's going to be wonderful and you're going to be leading the parade and oh, the places you'll go and you're going to be, you're going to soar and then you're going to fall. Because sometimes even when you try to make the best choices that you can make and when you try to do the things that feel like they're right, they're not. People are going to leave you. Um, You're going to end up, you know, sad at times. You're going to act the way that maybe you know you shouldn't act. You're going to be mean to people. People are going to be mean to you. But then you get to the waiting place. Sometimes you're just waiting. Okay. And then (gasps) we're doing good things again. And it says, let me find the right page. It says, oh, the places you'll go, there is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame, you'll be famous, as famous can be, with the whole wide world watching you on TV. Except when they don't. Because sometimes they won't. And that's the truth. Sometimes we think we're the star and we want to be the center of attention and we think we're doing everything awesome and it's great and then we're not again. And then it gets kind of dark and there's a dark blue place and there's some sea monsters. Those are never fun. And then we finally get to the end. You get mixed up in the wrong crowd sometimes. There's these weird looking bird-like creatures. I don't know what they are. And then... And you will succeed. Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So be your name Bucksbaum or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai, Allie, Van Allen, O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Now, watch this. Raise your hand if you've ever made a mistake. Turn around and look. Everybody looking? Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like you were the only one who ever had to do this before. Oh, my gosh. Raise your hand if you've ever been scared. 
Raise your hand if you've ever done anything awesome. You see, everybody's been there. And Dr. Seuss writes about how there'll be ups and downs. One of the things he leaves out is what we're covering today in church. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God, we live, move, and exist. God is beside us on the path. So one of the things I want you to remember, whether you're five or 10 or 15 or 18 going on 32, (laughs) or whether you're 101, The thing you need to remember is that the path that you travel will sometimes get a little twisted and sometimes seem a little dark, but God is with you. And not only that, everybody in this room is with you. If your next journey is middle school or kindergarten or college or a new job or retirement, God is with you. I'm going to pray, but first, this is how much I love this book. These are Oh, the Places You Will Go pencils, okay? And they have different Oh, the Places You'll Go stuff on them. So let's pass them around. That's a good rubber band. I want you to take two, one for yourself and one for somebody who at some point looks like they need to be reminded that even though they're going to go good places, sometimes the road gets a little tricky. Okay? Give them one and pray for them. All right? Half there. Half there. And while we're doing that quietly, I'm going to pray, okay? God, thank you. Thank you for being with us no matter what, for guiding us, for walking with us, for helping us when the twists and the turns get us all mixed up. Help us to do your will, to follow in your footsteps, and to love one another. Amen. Jesus teaches the disciples about how God will abide with them evermore a reading from the gospel of john if you love me you will keep my commandments i will ask the father and he will send another companion who will be with you forever this companion is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him you know him because he lives with you and will be with you i won't leave you as orphans i will come to you Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Here ends the gospel lesson. And our hymn of stewardship today is number 283, Holy Presence, Holy Teacher. We'll stand as we sing together.
Shall we pray? God, this morning we have all been reminded of how truly blessed we are here in this nation, in this country, in this room. Because, Father, we have been reminded of your awesome wisdom and the love that you have for us. Father, you bless us with all that you have. You, you give freely of your love and everything that is yours. This morning, we bring our gifts to do the same, to share, to share with everyone of your love that you have. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, here we are at graduation Sunday once again. And as I've said to you before, for now the past four years, uh, this is one of my favorite times of year. I am that strange person that loves graduation. And as someone who has been in student ministry for <clears throat> 12 years now, which is hard to believe, there's just something about this rite of passage that is special. And while it's not officially a part of the Christian calendar, to me it feels like a natural part of the rhythms of life and faith. In case you don't know, about twice a year I eat, sleep, and breathe commencement at the university because that is a major component of my job. So there's so much symbolism and tradition that is wrapped up in graduation and commencement. And every year and every semester, I realize that a student or two or a hundred have no idea the reason for the robes and the caps and the tassels and the pomp, and they think they're just instruments of torture to make us all sweat. And I guess that's another reason why there's similarity for me between the Christian calendar and graduation. Because symbolism abounds in worship, especially the way we do worship here. Tradition abounds. It's everywhere, from the candles to the pyramids and the vestments and the colors and the cross placement in the sanctuary and the fact that it's empty. All of these things mean something. They mean something significant, and they come from centuries of tradition. And graduation is like that. Every element means something, even if we no longer talk about what it means. So the teacher in me feels the need to just share a little, not a lot, with you about where this stuff came from. The very word commencement means to start or to begin in French. And the modern academic procession reflects traditions inherited from medieval universities. When a member of the teaching faculty was considered to be a master of arts and an apprentice was considered a bachelor. So long robes and warm hoods started in medieval drafty stone universities where they were practical and used for warmth as well as distinguishing those who have worked hard to master a craft. And in the commencement ceremony, the new degree holders are visibly received into the academic community. You turn your tassel from the left to the right. You walk across a stage and receive some sort of diploma or degree, and you return to your seat a new member of a league of scholars. The dignity and meaning of all this academic costume is actually protected by careful regulation. You probably didn't know, but here's your trivia for the day. In the United States, nearly all institutions adhere to a national code adopted in 1895 and revised again in 1932. Deep traditions and symbols that are meant to make both the participants and the audience members reflect on their own journeys and on the chapters of their own stories. Much like the rhythms of the church calendar and the symbols and traditions here are meant to make us pause and reflect on how our stories are woven into God's story. And each year the lectionary also seems to deal us preachers texts that just ask to be spoken to graduates. And you've heard me say this before, but Ascension Sunday, I've said, is like graduation day for the disciples. But this year, as I read this gospel lesson, I revised that a little bit and realized that Ascension Sunday, well, that's kind of like the degree conferral. 
That's when the disciples literally walk down a mountain and out into the wide world, much like graduates walk across the stage and are sent forth to a new beginning. And so if Ascension Sunday, which is coming up, is kind of like degree conferral, I can't help but read Jesus' words in the gospel lesson today and think what a great commencement address. I feel as though we're getting to read Jesus' graduation charge to his beloved disciples and followers who will soon be embarking on the next chapter of their story too. They know that Jesus' earthly time is drawing to a close and his disciples know that they are on the brink of heading out into a wide world without Jesus present in the same way that he has been for the last three or so years. There must have been some mixture of excitement for the future, a bit of nostalgia for the past, maybe a hint of fear about the unknown, and just some generalized anxiety. Are we ready for him to not be walking with us? Can we do this? Will we remember what he taught us? Will other people believe us? How, how will we show them that Jesus is really alive if they can't see him and touch him like we did? Think back to your graduation moments in life the times where you stood on the brink of a new beginning or a new chapter, those same feelings had to be present in this moment we read about in John. And it's almost as if Jesus can sense these anxiety-riddled questions that are swirling through the minds of the disciples because he steps up to the podium and gives them words of reassurance that they won't be left as orphans, that there will be another companion, a comforter, an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will travel with them. And how about that for a commencement charge? Jesus will still be seen through them. They will still be able to see Jesus in and through each other if they keep Jesus' commandments and leave it to a teacher to not be able to resist one final mental test in a commencement address. We and the disciples have to think back a little bit on what exactly did Jesus command that we're supposed to keep. Well, we know that one, don't we? Jesus responds to the Pharisees that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is followed by that beautiful and challenging story of the Good Samaritan, just in case we get tempted to think that our neighbors are only those we like and agree with. And I have to imagine that if Jesus were to appear here at one of our modern commencement ceremonies and offer this graduation day message to the disciples and by extension to us, he would say something like this. As you look ahead, remember who you are. Remember your travel companions are on this journey of life and faith with you. Remember who walks with you as you go. Remember to see them. Remember to love them. And in doing that, you will see me. And just like that walk to Emmaus, you'll remember by the end that you aren't alone. You will never walk alone. It's a beautiful and multi-layered charge because Jesus reminds them 
to love their neighbors, their community, each other as they journey. And because I've lived through about a million graduations by now, I also picture that this is the moment where the screen comes down and the video montage of the pictures of the disciples starts playing, probably to Stephen Curtis Chapman and a friend's a friend forever. You know that one, yes. And so we'd be treated at this moment to a bunch of snapshots of the disciples over the last three or so years. You know, a group shot on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, using a selfie stick, of course. Peter with one leg poised on the edge of the boat, ready to jump off, and everybody else reaching for him. A shot of all of them dressed up and laughing at the wedding of Cana. James and John bickering over who's going to be greatest while the others facepalm in the background. Thomas reaching out his hands to touch his risen Lord. Mary and Martha hugging and crying as Jesus opens his arms to welcome Lazarus back from the dead. Snapshots that capture these faithful companions on the journey who may go their separate ways from this moment on, but will forever be linked Jesus' words and the video playing in each of the minds and hearts of those there that day urges them to remember who travels with you on this journey of life and faith. But Jesus also reminds his graduates that the Holy Spirit, a literal peace of God, will also be a companion with and an advocate for them on the road ahead, a force to be reckoned with, the one who will enable them to remember Jesus' teachings, who will nudge them in the right direction, who will help them see the world around them through the eyes of their creator, and who will reassure their hearts and souls that they do not walk alone. And so as you look ahead to the next chapter in your story, remember who you are and remember who goes with you on this journey of your life and faith. Because it's both human and divine. Graduation Sunday is sentimental to me, but this one in particular is because Destiny and Becca are the first teenagers that I journeyed all the way through high school with here at FBC. And I remember four years ago that after Zach and my very first full week in Middlesbrough, we had our church picnic. And because all of you were being so conscientious about not overwhelming us and letting us get settled in, no one actually mentioned where the picnic was. nor did we really have anyone's cell phone number at that time. So we were late (laughs) because we were sort of wandering around the national park trying to find where everyone else was. But we found it, and when we finally did, I pulled my camp chair up next to Destiny. And we talked and hung out for basically that whole evening. And that was the start of a great four years. And it wasn't long after that that I met Becca, who joined our small girls group. And she and I would spend time on Wednesday nights getting caught up on life, on watching out for the girls that were younger, and just making sure we had a read on what was going on. And we have walked through a lot in the last four years, have we not, ladies? We've gone through the ups and downs of high school, including relationship highs and lows, late night texts and phone calls, struggles and successes, trips to cheer competitions to cheer on others, cheese fries, learning about and from women who have changed the world, countless hours volunteering around town and at Extreme Build, and discussing how life and faith intersect and what it means to be a leader. We've shared laughter and tears and hot chocolate and pancake muffins 
and scavenger hunts and running around hotels and almost drowning on a water slide, which is a fun story I'll tell you later. <laughs> and life with you two has been meaningful and wonderful. And I, on behalf of your church family, am so very proud of you. And we are excited to see where this next chapter takes you. And so on this graduation Sunday, the symbolism of commencement and of worship are woven together to remind us all that we are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Jesus' words ring true for you and for all of us. Remember who goes with you on this journey of life and faith. Your family, your church family, your friends, your neighbors, and above all, the Holy Spirit. To all of us, when life brings new challenges and new beginnings, remember Jesus' graduation day charge. And I can't help but think that in a modern graduation ceremony, Jesus' final prayer of blessing over the new graduates and us would be one that reminds us that as we go, remember who we are, remember who travels with us. And I think the choir sang that prayer just a moment ago. Your will cannot lead me where your grace will not keep me. Your hand will protect me, I rest in your care. Your eyes will watch over me, your love will forgive me. And when I am faltering, I still will find you there. That's the good news of the gospel, friends and fellow graduates, fellow travelers on the journey, that no matter where the road takes us, whether it's near or far, we never, never walk alone. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Destiny and Becca to come up, and I'll move this microphone out so you don't have to stand on this speaker over here. Destiny and Becca are our two high school graduates. You just heard some about them. We'll, we'll get back to some of that uh, shenanigans later. Uh, and hear more about that. But at this time, I want to present you two with a gift from the church, and then I want to invite you all to join with us in the litany that's on the back of that insert I talked about earlier. First, um, both of you will get a copy of Anne Lamott's book called Traveling Mercies. The title is perfect. The subtitle is Some Thoughts on Faith. She has lots of those. Uh, Anne Lamott is one of those special people to me, uh, and that's why I'm giving you this book. Uh, Anne Lamott uh, has some of the best lines that I know of about good, deep Christian theology. Uh, one of those lines being, uh, hatred is like eating rat killer and then waiting for the rat to die. <laughs> See, that's pretty good stuff. You didn't know it. You didn't know some theologians talk like that, did you? She does. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Uh, Anne Lamott is also the person that uh, says the best prayer she knows is, help me, help me, help me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I bet everybody in the room has prayed that prayer many times in their life's journey. And you have, and you will again. So I give you Anne Lamott's book uh, for one thing to read. The other is a Bible. Of course it's a Bible. This is a Baptist church, isn't it? <laughs> I know. I mean, if you're if you're 45 and you don't have 16 Bibles from your church, you're going to a different church. <laughs> uh, it's a Baptist church, but this Bible is special because this Bible is the first Bible in the Common English Bible translation that I have given to any graduates. Because, as you know, this one is becoming the Pew Bible soon in this room. The deacons and I have been working on that. And you will be the first two to get the Common English Bible as a graduation gift. Yeah, congratulations. We'll make sure that makes it into the history room. But uh, this is a wonderful translation. It has been worked on by multiple denominations. And I, the more I use it, the more I love it. So you each get a copy of this as well. Yep. If you would, please stand, get that litany, and join us in leading uh, a blessing, a sending prayer to our graduates. Today we recognize the academic achievements of our graduates. We celebrate with them during this time. We thank you for the many people who have guided our lives. You have given us many examples to follow, those who taught us to believe in ourselves and to believe in you. On this day, we celebrate these who have used their gifts to further their knowledge. Give us the grace to apply this knowledge to our lives and to your service. Lord, we trust these graduates to your care, knowing that you walk with them. Go forth from this place as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. God, grant us the power to serve you. And as the resurrected Christ died with the disciples, God, Destiny and Becca, we are proud of you. And following the service, I want you to stand with me in the doorway and let everybody hug on you. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, as long as you're on time, right? <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Stop that. 278 in your hymnal as you keep standing, please.
And because today is a full day and a graduation day and an Easter day, if you would, be seated one more time. I promise you'll still beat the Pentecostals to lunch. <laughs> they take a while. Christy would like to give uh, Becca and Destiny one more gift. And if you don't know, Christy is a cricket user. Pray for us. Uh, but uh, that's what this is, is a framed uh, copy of the prayer that she prayed that the choir sung. Uh, the handbells have a gift for us today in the form of a postlude. I invite you to stay and hear that and then to go in peace.
And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>